Before we begin the questions, can you please tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes, I am uh, Len Smith. I am 84 years old. I shall be 85 in October of this year. But the probably interesting thing is, I am uh, the youngest male member of a family of 16, 12 boys and 4 girls. I just have one sister younger than me. Yep. Now, um, of that 16, of the 12 boys, 8 of us all served in the army during 1939 to 45. And we all came back in one piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, two two of the lads were injured. One was uh, injured at uh, Monte Cassino in Italy, and uh, the other one was injured at Tarn. He got shot before he landed on the ground. But um, they both survived, and they all had good lives thereafter. Yeah. Um, what were you doing at the start of the war? What was I doing at the start of the war? I was actually training on uh, boot and shoe repairs. Just, you know, training to do about boot and shoe repairing. Um, we had been bombed out by that time, but that's another story. When did you join up? I joined up in, um, just after October, when I was 18, and as soon as I was 18, instead of waiting to be called up, I volunteered. So that uh, for that, that reason, because I I joined up in the army, of course, I didn't join up in anything else. I don't know, I was already serving. So uh, that was just, you know, the start of it all, really. What was it like when you first joined up? Oh, a big shock, let me tell you that. I done my training at Norton Barracks, Worcester, under the instructors of uh, the 1st Battalion, the Royal Worcestershire Regiment. And you talk about bullying today, you had no idea what bullying was like till you trained under them. They'd all be locked up today, I think. <laughs> it was really, really tough. But I enjoyed every moment of it. It, it made a man of me at that time. I went in a bar and I came out a man when I finished my training. It was brilliant. How were you trained? Um, normal basic route marches, you know, learned how to march properly, how to respect officers in particular, and things like that, you know. And then, because I'd, I'd volunteered for the Royal Army Service Corps, which was and still is, uh, the transport section of the British Army and they drive all sorts of vehicles, you know. And I was sent to um, Carlisle to the RAC training depot, and that is where I passed my driving test. And I passed my driving test in July 1943. Mm -hmm. yeah. Where were you first sent? Oh. Then I was posted to a company, an RASC company, and um, we moved about all, all over the country actually. And we ended up in a Thetford, Norfolk. And just after that, we took over the amphibious ducks. In that, before that, I'd be, drove all kinds of vehicles from three tonners down to a little. Uh, Ford pickup. I drove staff cars, learned to drive everything, but we never never realised we'd ever be driving something like a duck. Now a duck is a, a six wheel vehicle and the duck stands for a uh, year of manufacture, four wheel drive and a transfer box. It's an American vehicle made by the GMC and it was absolutely brilliant. There was an, as I say, there was an amphibious class, but the most interesting thing of course was they could not only go on the sea, they could also drive on the land. So that's what made them so brilliant. It was very useful. Yeah, so we did a lot of training. We, we trained with the Navy. We, um, 
driving on and off landing craft. They had various different types of landing craft in the Navy. One was the LS, LSCT, which was a landing craft tank, it only took one vehicle. But the LS, LSTs they took lots of, either lots of personnel or and vehicles. They could take several vehicles. There was a, a, what you put, the best way I think I could describe them was to say that there was like a mini um, um, word I'm trying to think of ferry. They was like a mini ferry in a way because as I say they had more than one vehicle and they could carry a lot of personnel at the same time. Yeah. What was D Day? D-Day was an operation that was jointly conjured up by the British government and the American government to remove the Germans from occupation of territories in France, Belgium, Holland and, North, uh, and up, all the way up to Germany to push them back into their own country, if you can understand what I'm saying. And it was codenamed Overlord. That was the actual name it was given. Where did you land on D-Day? I landed on D-Day, but before I landed we were loaded, as I say, we have been practising on these LSTs. But when it came to landing up on the 5th of June, 1944, me, I was landed on top of a supply ship on the top deck, not on one of these LSTs. I asked why, and they told me to warn me on because you just get on with it. Yeah. So I couldn't understand this till much, much later. The reason being was that I was landed, I was loaded on my dub with stretchers. Yeah. So we loaded up and we landed. I, I was dropped off about a mile, mile and a half from the beach in front of Benair Samir on Juno Beach because I was attached to the 3rd Canadian Division. And I, as I say, I was landed about a mile and a half away and had to drive on the sea from the supply ship onto the beach. It wasn't too bad, it was quite, fairly quiet because it was around 7 o'clock on D-Day morning. So I'd had more instructions that when I landed I was to report to the beach master. Each beach had a beach master and a beach crew. That was all British. And I landed on the beach and I drove on the beach and then along the sea wall to my right to the beach master. And he said, right, he said, on, we'll unload your stretches here because there's going to be a, a first aid point here, you know, dressing station. He said, then get yourself onto that sea wall to give yourself some protection and wait for the rest of your unit to come ashore. All right. Now I, I done that and when I turned and looked back out to sea, it was the most unbelievable sight imaginable. There were ships of every kind and size, from large to big ones, you know. HMS Belfast was anchored off about two, two, three miles offshore, and there were ships everywhere as far as you could see, left or right. And uh, about half an hour later, of course, the, the main force, attack forces, started to come ashore. And it, it, it's hard to describe, very difficult to describe. Yeah? yeah. What was the experience like then um, of being there on D-Day? Um, it, it, I'm just saying it's very hard to explain. Very exciting, because I, you, you can remember I was just a young lad of 18, mm -hmm. uh, 19 at that time just 19, driving this massive vehicle that you, could, you wouldn't be allowed to drive it today at 19. But sitting on that moor and seeing those 
uh, land forces come ashore, seeing boats destroyed with those men on, vehicles just going up in the air. It's something I don't really discuss. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of death and destruction. But I said to myself, well, you got a job to do, get on with it. If you want to survive, just get on with it. And that was it. And the same of the rest of my platoon come ashore, well, some of them, because they were spread well, uh, far and wide. Being ducks, they didn't want to be all set in one place and be a real target, you know. What happened to you after that? Well, we, we were, well, the Canadians, they took up, uh, took uh, ben uh, Benares and Air was the actual place we were all in. It was like a sort of holiday, a small town, you know, not big, but it was a small town. And the Canadians had, had actually taken Benares and Air by about midday, 12, 12, 12, 30, you know, that sort of time. And they'd set up a supply depot in a field about, just about five miles in land. So that is, now this is a little interesting point, that, that um, we were told, given the very strict orders by the British Master, we was not at any circumstance stopped to help any wounded soldiers or pick up any dead. He was to get out there, get the supplies off the ships and get them back on shore. And that's what we were into this supply dump, you know. And um, that's how it went. And of course, we were bogged down then for five weeks there. And that's what we did all day long, was just bring supplies ashore off the supply ships. They could never get away from the bridge quick enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? What was your most memorable experience of the it's got to be when I parked up on that seawall, turned back and saw what was behind, what was there out at sea. As I say, it, it's almost, you can't explain it, it's not possible. And what happened just after, you know, all, all hell broke loose, you know. Because what they'd done, they'd done a decoy operation up in um, Calais. The Germans thought the invasion was going to be up in Cali instead of that it was farther down, much farther down. And we got, they got caught napping a bit too because uh, Rommel, who was in charge of that area, the German commander, he'd gone home to celebrate his wife's birthday. <laughs> <laughs> so they couldn't organise any counter attacks really, you know. What happened when the war ended? When the war ended, oh, oh, I was, I drove all the way up, we worked our way all the way up after Calm fell in July, right up to Hamburg. We ended up in Hamburg and um, that was about it, you know, I, I ended up on a, working for the, you know, attached to the Royal Engineers doing an airfield in uh, Kiel. And then we went back to Hamburg and we came back to England, had a fortnight's leave. I only ever had one leave from the time I joined up till then. And then we went out to Cairo for the last 12 months. Yeah. Thank you for your time. Yeah, Thank you. Thanks for answering our questions. Thank you for your time for answering our questions. Yes. Thank you very much for listening to me. And I'm very, very proud that young girl like you has taken interest in such things. Because there's not enough of it. I don't, I don't believe there's enough of this sort of thing being taught in the schools today mm -hmm. and I'm very very pleased to be here today to be able to talk to you and thank you very very much for your questions. <laughs>